people she's met people also on the Facebook side of things. So to everyone who's joining us from the various places you are, as we are um, doing this in, in the virtual realm, um, on behalf of my colleague Karen and everyone else at the Elliott Bay Book Company, which is on Duwamish land in the city of Seattle in the northwestern part of the of North America or the United States. Um, we're sort of, we did an earlier program today in Germany, so we we're casting ourselves in the, in the, um, in the world that way, but uh, we're delighted you're here with us and um, we're delighted and, and thrilled to be ha having this program tonight with Perry Klass, um, author, doctor, and educator um, who has been with us before uh, and she's gonna be joined in conversation by Janice P. Nomura. Um, and I'll say a little more about Janice and oh, both of them, but we, um, this book, uh, we're, we're doing this in, in, in conjunction with the publication of uh, newly in paperback of Perry Class's um, most recent book, The Best Medicine, How Science and Public Health Gave Children a Future, um, published, first published uh, in 2020, and now um, this new paperback edition um, has, has just come out. And Perry Class is a writer who, um, we were saying a little bit about it has actually been to Elliott Bay in, in several books and several um, years ago. Um, she among the among the the many the new well there aren't that many um, excellent writing doctors, um, which include people such as Atul Gawande, Ayram Verghese, um, Sid, Siddhartha Mukherjee, and Simi Yasmin. Perry is probably the one who's been um, written the most in both fiction and in. Um, Nonfiction works um, and has done so uh, along with being a professor of journalism and pediatrics at New York University and um, also active in sort of a larger sphere within NYU as being co directing its uh, residencies in Florence program. Um, that was a little bit of our talk about Florence, if you heard that at the beginning. Um, th this new book is a really important and timely book about children's health um, in various public spheres and that certainly in, oh, in the last two years um, taken on heightened importance with um, both the sort of programs of health, for children's health but also you know the various med medicinal programs that come about and um, this book which also does a lot of historical um, research you know re re narrative to that um, is also important in giving backgrounds as we sometimes I think forget the ground that we're standing on in terms of um, what we have today and what it's taken to get there and how fragile those things are as various um, place, think, forms of standards sometimes get eroded or chipped away at. In talking with Janice Nomura, we're having Janice back, um, who actually was in Seattle um, and with Elliott Bay at a program, we, a wonderful program, if I'm going back about 2015, I'm guessing, um, for a program we did at the Seattle Asian Art Museum for her first book, uh, earlier book, The Daughters of the Samurai, A Journey, from East to West and Back, um, a book that received uh, a lot of attention and acclaim. It was a New York Times Nobel book, Notable Book Award that year. And uh, her most recent book, um, The Doctor's Blackwell, which brings her a little closer to this, the subject of what Perry's written, um, is a book that was a 2022 Pulitzer Prize finalist. And I think in Janice's biography, um, her, own, her own kind of sketch, um, there was some, med um, draw an interest in medicine in her background that um, a, a future she might have taken uh, but but she continues she's written about it and this most recent book is a, a very um, vivid and strong testament to it. Um, Janice and Perry and, uh, have known each other we were talking to share uh, the same editor and the same publisher and um, I think that you know, this conversation that they'll have um, will draw on that as well as um, the, the things they both know and what Perry's written about in The Best Medicine. So the program will include um, some images that Perry will show after once we get going. Um, she and Perry and Janice will be um, engaging in conversation, but we hope you'll add to it by putting your questions in um, the chat, which Janice will work in along the way. And um, Karen's besides um, putting information in the chat about um, both Perry and Janice's books, um, and, there, and again, uh, I think Perry's got about seven works of fiction and six works of or six works of fiction and seven works of nonfiction. Karen will have that information in the chat, and then Karen will come back in at the end 
um, to thank everyone and see us all up into the night. We appreciate both of them. They're um, uh, Perry's in uh, Cape Cod, and uh, which is at least easier for time zones than Florence would have been doing this now. And Janice is in uh, in New England, so uh, they're both joining us from on into the evening, which um, we're also glad they um, appreciate they're doing. So with that, again, for all of us at Elliott Bay, thank you for being with us. And now please join in giving good virtual attention and applause to Prey Class and Janice Nomura. Thank you both. Thank you, Rick. I'm so thrilled to be with you and even more thrilled to be here because of Perry. Um, meeting Perry was one of the bright spots of the pandemic for me. We both um, call New York home base a lot of the time and um, very cold outdoor coffees in the winter became a real source of um, inspiration for me. Um, I think Perry is going to lead off tonight because this is a celebration of um, the paperback launch of The Best Medicine. Uh, lead off with some images and um, some words uh, that'll sort of set the scene and the tone for this incredible book. Um, it really is not just an important, a book with an important message, but it's a, it's a book that's just stuffed with stories um, that are riveting. So take it away, Perry. Thank you so much, Janice. It's a thrill to be here. Thank you, Rick. Um, love Elliott Bay. And it's an honor and a delight to be here talking with Janice, um, who's a wonderful writer. And as she says, has been a, a, a friend and companion to talk about uh, medicine, doctors, women, pandemics, and writing. Um, I'm going to start by showing you some images and talking to you about, uh, to me, this is a book which is about what may be the greatest thing we've ever done as human beings, as a species. Um, a collective achievement which brings together medicine and public health and sanitation and advocacy and doctors and nurses and parents so that over the course of time, we have driven down the likelihood that infants and children will die. And in doing that, in making that happen, we have changed the world. And what I wanted to do in this book was look at what went into that achievement, look at the ways in which it is not a complete achievement, some of the disparities and problems which still exist, but also try to reach back into um, a past world which was for I think all of us, and I'm a pediatrician, unimaginably different. Um, this is a graph from the Centers for Disease Control about infant mortality defined as the number of babies out of every thousand born alive who die before the first birthday. And it takes you across the 20th century from say the first couple of decades, the teens and twenties, when my grandmothers were having their babies, when my parents were being born to the end of the 20th century when I was training in pediatrics. And it's a pretty stark graph if you look at it. It shows you that back at the beginning of the century when my grandmothers were pregnant, if you sat a group of people around a table, everyone would have lost a baby, lost a sibling, lost a friend in childhood. It was so common. Um, and it was something which touched every family. And I think for me as a pediatrician, that's an almost unimaginable world. And certainly for me as a parent, that's an almost unimaginable world. And if you look at estimates stretching back across history, again, you see just how shockingly, almost unimaginably common it was, that world in which 20, 30, 40% of the children didn't make it to their fifth birthdays. Um, I'm showing you a poem here by the American poet Longfellow written in 1848 called Resignation, written on the occasion of his daughter Fanny's death at the age of one. And it was a very, very beloved poem. There is no flock, however watched and tended, but one dead lamb is there. There is no fireside house so air defended, but has one vacant chair. The poem's called Resignation. Longfellow loved his daughter. He wrote about how much he missed her. Her mother wrote about how desolate the house was, 
But what he could offer was resignation because this touched every family. And here's a letter from Charles Dickens who had 10 children and his baby Dora, who he had a habit of naming his children for his characters. So she's named for one of the characters in David Copperfield. And as a baby, she suddenly got sick, went into convulsions and died while her mother was out of town. And Dickens trying to break the news to his wife wrote to say, the baby is sick, I'm worried she may die. But what he said to his wife was, remember what I have often told you that we never can expect to be exempt as to our many children from the afflictions of other parents. And what I wanted to write about in the book is how we got from resignation and we never can expect to be exempt to the way we think about childhood death today. And here's a, a book about palliative care, end of life care for children from 2003. So it is about the death of children, but it says right in the introduction that a child's death in a very real sense is unnatural. I wanted to think about how we got to that unbelievably wonderful idea that a child's death is and should be unnatural, or as the director of the CDC said last summer, testifying in Congress and being asked about um, how there were at that time only, only 400 childhood deaths from COVID, her passionate response, children are not supposed to die. I wanted to both acknowledge and celebrate how we got there. Um, and so in thinking about the book, I think about doctors, I think about what they did here. The um, bearded mustachioed gentleman is Abraham Jacoby, who is usually thought of as the founder of American pediatrics, my field, um, author of many, many learned works, including this 1880 treatise on diphtheria, a disease I've never seen, a bacterial infection of the throat, probably knew more about it than anyone in the world. Um, that's his son Ernst who died at the age of seven of diphtheria because no matter how much you knew there was no treatment. And so I think some of the stories that come through are both about the, the doctors and the nurses and the scientists who grappled with these diseases but also about some of the inequities and social issues which existed back in the 19th century and still exist today. Here's another child who died of diphtheria, um, the son of W.E.B. Du Bois, the sociologist, civil rights activist, brilliant writer who wrote in his book, The Souls of Black Folk about that firstborn son, Burkhart, and about how he developed diphtheria as a um, small child in Atlanta. And there was no white doctor in Atlanta who would treat him. And his parents decided not to bury him in Georgia, but to carry him back to Massachusetts. Um, by the time Burkhart got sick, there was a treatment and his mother always believed that if they had stayed in Philadelphia, he would have gotten treated because it mattered very, very much where you lived. There were the issues of racism, but there were also, was also the issue of where the therapy was available. And the anti-serum, which was being produced by horses, was available at the time in New York as a public health measure. Um, this is another one of the stories which comes through the hero horses who had been put in a luxury stable and they were covered in the newspaper and they had names and they were producing the anti-serum which could treat diphtheria, um, but only as for certain cities in certain places. The other story which many people know about the conquest of diphtheria also um, involves heroic animals. It's the 1925 outbreak in Nome, Alaska, when that anti-serum can't get to the Eisden port of Nome, they get it from Anchorage to Nanana, and then the sled dogs with their mushers carry it over the Iditarod Trail, and there's Balto, the lead dog on the last relay, whose statue in Central Park is probably the most beloved memento of the um, fight against diphtheria, and there's Togo, who was the lead dog on the longest part of the trip. Um, 
but anti-serum will only get you so far. And what actually defeats diphtheria is vaccination. It's available by the 1920s. Here are the school nurses in New York. And just for something that will look very familiar today, there's the little card that every child is holding that gets filled in to say this child has been protected against diphtheria. As I say, a disease I've never seen as a pediatrician. I found, and I want to um, talk with Janice about this because she'll know more about the context than I do. There's a sort of fascinating complex world of um, 19th and early 20th century medicine, including a lot of really notable, interesting women doctors. Dr. Rebecca Crumpler, who's the first African-American woman to earn a medical degree in the US. Um, we don't have a photograph of her, so I've given you the title page of her book of medical discourses, two volume work that she publishes in the 1880s and dedicates to mothers, nurses, and all who may desire to mitigate the afflictions of the human race um, and writes about her experience taking care of children, both after the Civil War with a formerly enslaved population and in her practice in Boston on Beacon Hill. There's Dr. Josephine Baker, um, who becomes the first director of the New York City Bureau of Child Hygiene, which is the first such bureau in the United States, who decides to take on the problem of summer diarrhea, which kills so many infants every year. And in 1908, sends nurses in to visit newborns to talk about breastfeeding and ventilation. And there's a dramatic decrease in the deaths in that area. And what she writes, is I had learned one certain thing. He did not necessarily kill babies. There are her troops. As I say, this wasn't just doctors. This was nurses. This was parents. This is a group. These are the visiting nurses on the Lower East Side. These are the nurses from the Lincoln School established in 1898 because many nursing schools would not admit Black women. Um, this is one of their graduates, one of the most important um, um, nurses working in Philadelphia in the Black community, um, working on infant mortality, working on tuberculosis, and here educating a group of children. This is a little mother's club in which she's using a doll to teach children how to safely take care of their baby brothers and sisters. There's a milk depot giving out pure milk um, to women and children in New York City. It's not any one effort. It's not any one group. It's so many things working together. Last set of stories I want to bring up. As I say, I showed you a doctor authority who couldn't keep his child safe. I'm there are disparities. It's worse to be poor. It's worse to be marginalized. It's worse to come from a community that is victimized by racism and prejudice. But nobody is safe in the world that I'm talking about. And for a sort of sample of people who you might think of as powerful as well connected, I can tell you that if you look at the US presidents from Washington to Lincoln, every single one of them who has children loses at least one child. And if you move on into the 20th century, you can look at um, the presidential children. You can look at a baby Ruth um, Cleveland who dies in um, 1904 of diphtheria. She gets the anti-serum, but it doesn't save her. You can look at um, Ike Eisenhower, the first son of Dwight Eisenhower who dies of scarlet fever, um, which is caused by the bacteria that causes strep throat. And um, there's no treatment for it in 1921. You can look at Calvin Coolidge Jr who's playing um, tennis on the White House lawn, gets a blister on his toe, develops blood poisoning and dies at Walter Reed. Um, and you can look at the only baby born in the 20th century to a sitting president, um, the son of John and Jacqueline Kennedy, who's born premature and rushed to Boston to the same hospital where I trained. He's not very premature. He's about five weeks early. He's not very small. He's almost five pounds, but he develops respiratory distress syndrome. And there is no way to treat that in 1963, something which was told to us over and over 20 years later in that same hospital where I trained. So I hope that these stories give you a sense of the changes of the lost world and of the many people who 
are involved in contributing to this graph and to the change that I talked about to get us to a world where, although it's not an, an achievement we can fully celebrate, we can look at childhood death as unnatural, as something that should not happen. Um, and let me um, go back now to, if I can, um, to talk to Janice and to see what your questions are. Fantastic. Those images are so startling in so many ways. Um, I want to start us off by reading the first two sentences of your book, which go like this. Our grandparents and great grandparents and all the parents before throughout history expected that children would die. It was a known and predictable risk that went along with being a parent. Now we expect children not to die. We are the luckiest parents in history. That's a, a like a, I'm speechless reading that. I mean, that's a stunning way to start this story. Um, but interestingly, in that brief couple of lines, you use the word history twice. And you are a, an author of, of a whole shelf full of books, everything from parenting guides to personal essays on being a physician to novels. This is the first time, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that you've written a work of archival history. Um, and I'm curious about your decision to go in that direction as a writer and as a physician? Well, I think one of the things that I felt as I began to think about this problem was that it was so striking, this change. Um, and yet it's almost referred to, I don't know, in parentheses in many books that you read or in many stories that you hear. Um, you know, it will sort of, you, you'll be reading something about um, somebody's life. You'll be reading about, and I choose presidents, and it's almost there in parentheses. Um, three of the babies died, but the fourth lived to grow up. Mm -hmm. and, or the idea that childhood death was as common as it is. It doesn't, and, and reading this as a pediatrician, because of course, nowadays, you go into pediatrics partly because it's kind of a happy specialty. Um, you go into pediatrics thinking that your patients will and should do well. I began to feel that there was this very important subtext that was somehow not getting the attention it deserved. And um, I, I, I'm married to a historian. We had been teaching a course on children and childhood together. And we kept coming back to, students would ask questions, what was it like for parents? Um, did people feel differently about their children when their children, they couldn't necessarily expect that their children would live to grow up? And I just, I'd be felt over and over again, it must have been so different to be a physician taking care of children if you had to assume that many of them wouldn't make it must have been so different as a parent and kind of wanted to hear those voices mm -hmm. and you can find them sometimes in literature you can find them sometimes in personal accounts but you have to look for them right how, how did you go about the looking did you were there certain troves of of stories in in you know, that, that, that sparked certain threads that you wove together? Well, you must know this from having done archival research. At a certain point, you become obsessed. Mm -hmm. um, whatever story you're hearing, whatever character you're talking about, you want to know, well, um, you know, uh, Picasso, uh, what about his siblings? Oh, he had a sister who died of diphtheria and he never got over it. Um, you know, you start looking up in people's biographies, you start hearing the echoes everywhere. Um, and then when you think about, you know, you, for me at a certain point it became, okay, Pasteur, what about his children? Did they live to grow up? How can I figure that out? And again, I would say again that there's a tendency, especially maybe in biographies of men to kind of pass over 
the question, mm -hmm. especially of, of infants dying. But when you look more closely, when you look, say, at the biography of Abraham Lincoln, um, people are very strongly affected by the loss of children. It changes them. It changes them forever. Right. Right. And you brought up the, the story of, of Abraham Jacoby and, you know, being an expert on diphtheria wasn't enough to save his seven year old son. And that's that's a story that's near to, to, to my work because of Abraham Jacoby's wife, Mary Putnam Jacoby, who um, was a very prominent female physician, a, a story that I'd, I'd like to tell, uh, you know, in addition. Um, go tell us a little bit about that and about and about the, the role of women in this in this extraordinary progress that was made well is it um, i love mary putnam jacoby i'd love to talk about her do you want to talk about her a little bit um oh. you know so much and you've done Wait so much about you know <laughs> i mean she she's a great character Right. So, so Mary Putnam, Putnam Jacoby um, and, and Abraham Jacoby were the power couple of 19, late 19th century me medicine. Um, she was the first woman to receive a medical degree, degree at the Sorbonne. Um, yes. she was and they an made American. her use a separate entrance so that right. she wouldn't contaminate the male students. Right. And so when she came back to New York to train, she um, founded a, a pediatric division of, of the, the, the hospital that had been founded by the Blackwell sisters that I wrote about. Um, and um, I, I just, I, I, today I was, I was refreshing my memory of, of her story as you tell it, um, which is both the story of a doctor, a parent, a mother, and a, and, a, and a physician and a wife, because there was a whole nexus of emotion around the loss of this child, both personally and professionally for this couple. Um, and it, it, just, it got me thinking about, um, about how women, I mean, you, you showed at the end of there a few slides of, of, of the women who drove this crusade forward. Um, and I spend, a, I, in, in the course of my work, I spent a lot of time thinking about whether there was something uh, you specific to being a woman in thinking about public health and whether you know whether there was something innately female about the the, the, the caregiving attitude of being familiar with the domestic setting and understanding innately instinctively what what hygiene meant what was required to make change for good well, you know, it's interesting if you read Rebecca Crumpler's book, and she's again the first African American woman to earn a medical degree in the United States. And it's a, you know, her voice is, is fascinating and strong. Nowhere in the book, although we know that she faced a fair amount, a, a lot of prejudice both in medical school and after because she was African American, she doesn't write about that in the book. She writes about the fact that male doctors patronize female doctors and that they tend to think that they only belong in the delivery room or the nursery. And then she says, and what's wrong with that? Where, where is a more important place? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not quoting her exactly, but she sort of, that she does complain about. She complains about, you know, being patronized because she is um, a doctress mm -hmm. and then says, but actually if we're taking care of the babies and we're taking care of the mothers, aren't we doing the most important work that there is? And so, I mean, what do you think? Some of it is about that's where the opportunity is. Mm -hmm. um, that's where women are perhaps more likely to have the chance to work. But some of it is clearly an interest in the sort of daily details of caregiving, caretaking, um, keep trying prevention. to keep children and prevention. Right. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, I definitely felt that researching the Blackwell sisters, who were the two of the earliest women uh, of all women to, to, to get degrees in the 1840s and 50s when, when the idea of hand washing was still kind of novel. Um, they had this instinctive sense that fresh air and cold water were forces for good um, in a way that the men just weren't interested in thinking about. And it, it always felt to me like they're you know, as, as, a, as a woman in a household, you grow up taking care um, in a way that, that, is, that is woven into your life as you grow. And so when you become a woman who is also involved in public health or in medicine, you bring that with you. 
Um, and so it's interesting to me that a lot of the, like Josephine Baker, like um, uh, you also talk about Edith Lincoln. Can you talk a little bit about her? She's another fascinating figure. She's a totally fascinating figure. She's uh, the person who founds the Children's Tuberculosis Clinic at Bellevue Hospital, a public hospital in New York City. And one of the things that I found both fascinating and moving about her is that when she founds the clinic in the 20s, she has no therapy to offer. They're taking x-rays, they're sending her the children. Um, a lot of them don't do very well, especially the babies, especially the children with severe tuberculosis, they die. And what she's publishing at that point is kind of natural history. She's following them to see how children with tuberculosis do. But the only therapy she's got is fresh air. Um, and then 20 years later, drugs are discovered and all of a sudden, and you can see this even in her very scientific accounts of what she's publishing, all of a sudden, the children are not gonna die anymore. She's got drugs and she's got something she can do. And I think that's, you know, it's kind of extraordinary to actually hear the voices of the people who start out looking at a disease, looking at polio, looking at tuberculosis, trying to treat it, but accepting, having to accept defeat in so many cases. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I, surely you thought about this when you were thinking about Blackwell sisters, a big part of medicine always is being realistic about what you can do and what you can't do. And when you, I mean, 19th century medicine, there was an awful lot you couldn't do. Like almost anything. Like almost <laughs> right? anything, right? I mean, right. I mean, there was there was no there were no good tools for peering inside. Um, so you just sort of had to guess and try stuff until somebody either died or recovered. Um, I, you know, I, I I'm I'm I, you you've talked about you know your grandmothers you know could never have imagined our ability to be sure of our children's safety at certain levels. Um, you know. So I, the idea that our generational memory of peril is fading in some ways, um, what does that mean for us today? Does that, does that are, are we becoming complacent? Uh, is, are, is that what we're seeing about people who are deciding to avoid vaccines? Or, you know, what do you think about that? Well, I think there's, there's two different things. You could ask, I mean, one, one thing that's absolutely true is it's very hard to be scared of the diseases of the past. I mean, when I say diphtheria, a chill does not go down your spine. It is, you know, never, you, you, never in your life did you, um, you know, lie awake wondering, do I have diphtheria? You would have to be a very paranoid medical student to have lain awake thinking, you know, maybe I have diphtheria. It's a, it's a, it's a disease that for the most part, especially in a, a privileged developed country, you're not going to see. And I think one, our thoughts about people who were hesitant about vaccines used to be, and I think this is something where the COVID pandemic has probably changed the balance, used to be that maybe people just didn't understand how scary these diseases would be. And um, that we somehow weren't communicating that properly. I think now we're living through a much more complicated time in terms of how people feel about vaccines and how what scares them and what doesn't and how they weigh risk. But on the other hand, you could have asked me a, a different question. You could have said, so if we're so lucky and we're so confident, why are we so anxious? As anxious, kids? right. <laughs> right, are we, are we actually, does this translate? Um, and I don't know, when I started writing this or what, at, at many points, I thought about the question of, are we actually more anxious because we feel we, if we make all the right decisions, if the baby is in the right car seat from the first trip home from the hospital, if you know we make all the right decisions about childproofing the house, if we control everything, then the child will be safe. It's almost a, a guarantee, but therefore it's kind of on us. You've got to make every decision properly. Um, I don't think that our that my grandmothers believed that they had that power. 
I right. think they lived in a much more dangerous world. They knew they lived in a much more dangerous world. Um, I, and that's one of the reasons I, th- I say this to you about even the children of the rich and the powerful, even the children of the medical experts. My grandmother might have said to you, even if you're John D. Rockefeller himself, because the Rockefeller Institute is founded by John D. Rockefeller, the richest man in history, when his beloved grandson dies of scarlet fever and he finds a research institute in part to try to solve these problems because as my grandmother might say, even if you're John D. Rockefeller and you can hire the best doctors in the city, there's still nothing they can do. Right, so, so it, there's a protective quality to not knowing. You can, there's, there's, there's space to say there was nothing I could have done because no one knows. But now, hallelujah, we have the internet and yes you're supposed to be able to find out the answer to anything. Um, I think parents feel a sense of sometimes terrified responsibility now. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'll make a wrong decision. Um, And I think, I think parents are, not all parents, but many parents are tremendously anxious about that sense of responsibility and that sense that there's always a, a right decision or wrong decision and it's, it's all on us. Mm. And um, I mean, some of this is, it's, it's, it, but I mean, that's not to say that anyone would say, oh, I'll trade that for, you know, much higher odds of something terrible happening because then I won't feel so responsible. It's a, it's a great, unbelievable thing as a parent to be able to say, um, I expect to see my children grow up. It's a, it's a great and wonderful thing as a pediatrician to say, I expect to see all my patients grow up and graduate and, you know, become adults. Right, right. Where do you think it's the, you know, the, the graph that you put up at the beginning, that beautiful graph that just curves down to nothing, where do you think that's going? And, and what, do you think, what do you think happens next in, 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 on that graph? Are there threats that um, are growing in some way that aren't necessarily microbial? Well, I mean, first thing to say is we're all worried about what the pandemic is doing, both in terms of exacerbating disparities, um, in terms of making things harder for groups which were already experiencing higher rates of infant mortality, child mortality, um, higher rates of accidents. And so what I, you know, what I should say immediately is that um, we don't have one simple infant mortality rate in this country. The infant mortality rate, like the maternal mortality rate, there are dramatic disparities. It's much higher in the Black community. It's higher in other um, communities which are victims of racism, which are marginalized in other ways. So the first thing you would say is that we need to figure out how to address those disparities. We need, and one of the things which probably pretty much most people in pediatrics would say is that means providing really good health care, not just to children, but to adults. And it doesn't just mean providing good health care to people when they're pregnant, it means taking care of, taking good care of you so that when you do become pregnant, you are less likely to be suffering from um, a whole lot of conditions which put you at higher risk during pregnancy. Most of the child mortality in this country at this point is infant mortality, and a great deal of the infant mortality is perinatal mortality is in the first weeks and month of life. And it reflects prematurity. It reflects problems which arise during pregnancy and during labor and delivery. And trying to bring that down has a lot to do with the health care that you provide during pregnancy, but also during adolescence and adult life before pregnancy. So well, it's the- not a... Right. Yeah. But I mean, we could just go back to, I mean, you know, when you when you're thinking about the infirmary for women and infants, right? It's it's not separating out 
the, the infants and the children, it's also thinking about what comes before birth right. and before pregnancy. Going into the home, finding out, you know, yeah. I think it was, um, was it Rebecca Crumpler or was it um, uh, another early black physician talking about that the, 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 the hygiene of your cellar has more to do with your own health than race. You know, that, that this idea that, 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 you know, the black communities or the immigrant Irish or Italian or Jewish or German communities in New York were, were less healthy didn't have anything to do with race. It had to do with what was growing in your basement. Yeah. Um, and you need to start there. Yeah. Um, I have to ask a, just a, a, a craft and an authorial question. I, I, wanted, I, I want you to speak to all the people in the audience who um, have enough trouble being just a doctor or just a writer. How do you balance your writing and storytelling life as someone who does both so excellently well? Oh, not very well. <laughs> <laughs> what it looks like from here. No, I, I think that it's, it's been a, a joy and a pleasure, but also I keep, I, I, every, for 30 years, I've been trying to develop a smooth response about how well every day I make sure that I, you know, put aside, and I, and I don't, I don't have a response like that. I'm, you know, disorganized behind. Um, but I was lucky as somebody in medical training to get the chance to write and to publish about what was happening to me. And that was, um, that let me keep hold of parts of parts of my brain or skills, which I otherwise might not have gotten to use. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a steady source of joy and of satisfaction. And um, I'm grateful for that. And grateful also that I, I started out when I, when I started writing nonfiction, I was writing about myself and my own training, but the fun of reporting, of asking questions, of getting other people to tell their stories, which is actually, um, also part of the joy of medicine, getting to go into a room and ask what would really be in any other context, a lot of extremely inappropriate nosy questions and having that be your job is really fun, don't you think? Oh, yes, certainly. And I'm not, I'm neither a journalist nor a doctor. It sounds awfully fun. <laughs> I think um, we've reached a point where we should probably allow other questions in. Um, just want to make sure that there, if, if, if people who are listening um, want to throw their questions into the chat, or if you're on Facebook, throw them there and we'll move them over. Um, we'll take them from there. But meanwhile, I have more. So um, what, what, I mean, what do you see as the, the next challenge for young pediatricians now? I the, the think that if you, I mean, the challenge for pediatricians right now, I think, is that parents are so challenged. This mm -hmm. has been a really hard couple of years for parents. Um, we were talking earlier about how hard it's been on kids, you know, adolescents and young adults, but it's also clearly, I mean, the pandemic has hit parents so hard in so many ways, parents of young children, parents of school-age children, it's parents are, I think, profoundly stressed. Children mm -hmm. are in many cases profoundly stressed and that um, trying to help, trying to take care of that, trying to address the issues of science and medicine and vaccines and help with all of that is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think pe parents have had a really hard time. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I think this book is 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 such a profound story of hope and and triumph. You know that 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 graph says it all. Um, and at the same time, there's something you know, and and I think the pandemic has really kind of highlighted, thrown into relief, how bad we are as a society at grief. Um, 
which was something the 19th century was really good at. There were all kinds of collective rituals about how to be sad and about how to mark loss that we have forgotten in large part. Can you speak to that a little bit, that, that sort of paradox? I, I'd be, I'd speak to it and I wonder if you wanna to speak to it because I think as you look at 19th century medicine, you must come up against that again and again. Um, one of the things that I write about in the book is the ways in which as child, I said to you that if in my grandmother's moment, if you sat any 15 people around the table and went around the room, everyone would have lost a child, lost a sibling, know someone, it would be a common thing. Now it's much rarer, which is a wonderful thing, but parents talk a lot about how isolating it is. Mm -hmm. There's no easy way, parents say, to bring up the fact that you had a child and the child is lost. It's, a, it's not something that anyone knows how to accommodate mm -hmm. or talk about or think about. And therefore it's it's very, very, or it can be very, very lonely. And as you say, we don't have rituals. You, there's not something you wear to send a signal. There's not uh, a way that you let the world know and receive their, their sympathy and their comments um, because it is not only so rare, but in many cases, something that people probably don't exactly want to think about. Um, I write about some of the ways that parents in the 20th century and the 21st century have reacted to losing children, for example, advocacy, passing a law, a child dies in a car accident and a parent campaigns for a law requiring car seats for older children named for the child who died. Mm -hmm. But what about if I turned it back to you and said, when you think about um, 19th century medicine, um, what did you think about grief and mourning? I mean, I mean the, there was a matter of factness to it that was startling to a 21st century researcher. Um, you know, the, as you say, this 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 idea that 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 list of presidents with every single president who had children had lost children. You know, Elizabeth and Emily Black Blackwell, I think, left four graves of siblings back in Britain before they emigrated with their families as children. Um, it was it was part of the fabric. Um, you know, uh, you know, but one of the sort of the formative some of the formative experiences of, of Elizabeth Blackwell before she made the decision to be a doctor was to nurse her father through his death. Um, you know, death at every level was part of the home and it was in the home too. That's another thing that we sure. don't have any connection to anymore. How many, I mean, how, it, it's very easy to find someone who's never been in the same room with a body. Um, so uh, the the distance now is is profound, and and it's a it's a it's a it, it, in the same way that 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 this is a story of, of incredible progress that that we could have eradicated or not eradicated but reduced infant mortality at that level in that reduced amount of time, and then also in the same short amount of time lost a, a kind of um, emotional. Uh, facet of our lives as humans, as, as human communities, is it, doubly stunning. Um, it, it's, it's both a triumph and, and, a, and a, a loss in some way, a, a loss of, of knowledge of how to bear pain um, that I find kind of interesting to think about. And I'm well, not sure. especially at a moment when there is so much loss, at a moment when we have to find ways both individually and collectively to acknowledge loss, acknowledge tragedy, acknowledge death, and somehow work it in. Right. And at the same time, I think this, this story is such an important one to focus on right now, because this is, this is a moment of, of, of a lot of darkness, a lot of, of, 
of, the, of a feeling of loss right now on, on many levels, both interpersonal and political and, 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 and sociological and, and, and historic. Um, and I think it's really important in this moment to focus on what has gone right, because so much has gone right. And we have made such progress. And it's easy when the clouds come to forget that. Um, yes, yes, I, yes. I think that's that's why this is a really important story for right now, that that curve continues into the future. And, and um, you know, we are we are benefiting from. Well, you that. must have felt researching your researching the doctor's blackwell, you must have felt every day. I am so glad that I will never have to go into a 19th century infirmary. Oh. Right. I'm so glad I will never have to have 19th century surgery, surely. Sure. And surgery um, being practiced by a man wearing an apron that is stiff with blood, having come from the, the, the dead house where he was performing an autopsy, not having washed his hands before he sticks them into my body, um, not understanding that antisepsis is a thing. Um, also, you don't get any anesthesia. Um, right, right, that too, right, yeah, um, all of that. Um, but, you know, my um, the, the the best Christmas present I ever got, I think, um, when when my book came out, my my husband found uh, an antique monaural stethoscope, which we, it wasn't the kind that you put in both ears. It looked a little bit like a little wooden trumpet, and you put the bell end on someone's chest, and you'd put the other bell in your ear and listen. Um, it was a beautiful artifact. Um, and, and, and a real connection to the physical um, practice of 1850s medicine. You can't hear a damn thing through it. <laughs> so how, what, what, you know, even, even taking, even, even listening to someone's heart, there was an art to using this instrument. Whereas, you know, my, my daughter who is an aspiring medical student received a, a stethoscope from her boss at the hospital where she was working as a, as a gift and a promise to the future, you stick that thing in your ears, you can hear everything that's going on. You don't need to practice for months on, on how to listen through. You know, the, 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 the level of, of groping in the dark, of, of really having no tools is, is astonishing. Well, it's, it's one of the things that's you know, wonderful about your book because the people who are determined to study this medicine, study this skill, study this art, what they can and can't do, but also the sort of the conditions of those wards, what they're seeing and what they're doing. Well, I mean, I would say to you then in a similar sense, there are lots of problems and lots of ambiguities. There are still despair. I, 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 I have a, a, a siren well-timed going on behind me right now. There are disparities, there are problems, there are conundrums, but the fact that you take certain slices of suffering out of the pie, that is to say, the fact that nobody is in, in almost most everywhere in the world now is looking at a small child with fever and worrying about polio or watching paralysis progress in a case of polio or what the children's war the dip children's wards of the 19th century were full of children with diphtheria slowly suffocating. Mm -hmm. And these are elements of human suffering which are gone. And I would say to you that that's an unequivocal good. That's right. And that's something that we do. And this is what I find sort of inspiring and wonderful about it, that it is such a patchwork, that it's lab scientists, that it's public health officials, that it's nurses, that it's parent advocates, that it's hygiene, that it's engineers, that it's sanitation, that it is all of these different specialties, all these different kinds of knowledge, pushing together in a positive direction. And that, yeah, you can say we, you know, there are many things that um, we don't do very well as humans, but we've got certain kinds of ingenuity, certain kinds of drive. And here are these wonderful things we can do when we put all of these different skills and specialties together and move things in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great message to to to. I I, I want to stop on a note of hope because this is this is what this is what this story is about. I you know I 
diving back into it today, this morning, you know, I, I kept, I kept skipping and then diving, talk about rabbit holes. Um, there are, there are narratives in here that, um, like you can almost hear the triumphant soundtrack. There's a million movies of, you know, like happy movies, you know, the, the ones that, that, that make you leave the theater cheering of, of, of just of, of triumphs. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a, it, it is more important than ever to focus on what has gone right. And the fact that we have the power to push ourselves forward. I think you're right. And I mean, I'm, I'm going to say the word vaccines here again as a pediatrician. I'm going to talk about the fact that, you know, this incredible piece of human ingenuity that we can um, turn on the immune system so that you can be protected without having to have the disease. That's an amazing piece of human ingenuity taking advantage of um, you know, amazing biological systems, and it we can't ever lose sight of what a triumph it is. Right. It's it's an it, amazing, amazing thing. And then it needs to be supported by all of those things you just listed. Not just the doctor with the needle, but the teacher, the 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 politician, the the public, the the sanitation worker who puts the sign on the side of the truck driving around. You know, I, the all of those things have to have to pull together to support it. But also that we need to find a way to possess enough historical memory to appreciate it and not to lose sight of the fact that it is a great victory and a great gift and you know some not something to take for granted. Right. That's why that's why you have to that's why that's why you do history. I mean, I I, I was a kid who hated history in, in school because I, it seemed so boring and irrelevant. I I am I, I, I understand now that history is stories about people that teach you about what you're what you need to know now. Um, and thank you for pulling all of these stories from the 19th century and the 20th um, that are so relevant to this moment. That, that is such a wonderful way of, um, of I think, closing out our program. And I can just, I can just see so many medical students and maybe high school students who would are interested in um, in medicine might read this, and also mm -hmm. casual readers that are interested in women's history and and also um, also. I think maybe th this is a good time for some books that are really encouraging us to think about where we come from. And, and yes, we've got a lot, a long way to go, but, but what can we do? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to end with one question from Perry of my own. And that is, um, so what, what do you think would make, what are, what is maybe one of the things that you would think that would make the biggest impact on the health of children now? on a particular population, on uh, children's health in general. And it's probably not gonna be just one thing, but what do you think would, would, would be really helpful? Oh, there are so many things. I mean, I'd have to say something about gun safety, of course. I'd have to say something about, you know, vaccines and better access and um, better access, especially for the communities on um, that are facing the disparities. Um, but I think if you wanted to get a little more global, I would say that you, one of the truths that you always learn over and over in pediatrics is that children don't walk into the room alone. If you're going to take good care of children, you have to support families and you have to support parents and you have to recognize all the ways in which being a parent, a parent of a small child, but also a parent of an older child is a hard job. And if you, I mean, I think it's something that every pediatrician knows, you have to support families, you have to support parents, you have to acknowledge how hard the job they're doing can be and you have to you know not expect them to do it out there on their own yeah wise words 
So thank you again, Dr. Perry Klass, author of The Best Medicine, educator, physician, journalist. We look forward to seeing more from you, books and more essays, of course. And thank you also, Janice Nomura, um, author of The Doctor's Blackwell, most recently. And we look forward to more books and articles from you as well. And thanks to everyone who joined us today for this, this talk and will be joining us later on Facebook and YouTube. We appreciate your taking time to tune in and um, thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Barry. you to Elliot Bay. Thank, thank you, Janice. We'll see you sometime in Seattle. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs>